Hello, and thank you for joining us for Public Health in Action, where we discuss various public health issues facing Stanley County. My name is Dennis Joyner, and I'm the director of the Stanley County Department of Public Health. One of the issues that we deal with on a regular basis is communicable disease, and sometimes uh, that involves uh, sexually transmitted diseases, or commonly referred to as STDs. Usually when we think about STDs, it's uh, some of the more common ones such as chlamydia or gonorrhea, perhaps syphilis or even HIV AIDS. However, uh, there's another one out there called HPV or human papillomavirus that is quite common and uh, actually is the most common sexually transmitted disease uh, that we see. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control actually uh, considers it to be uh, the most prevalent and it's uh, even thought that uh, every sexually active person over time may actually contract HPV at some point. In most cases, HPV goes away and is not a big problem. However, when it does not go away, it can result in additional challenges. I'm pleased to have with me today uh, Patty Lewis, who's a nurse practitioner with the Stanley County Health Department, and we'll be discussing HPV and various implications. Patty, thank you for, for joining us today. My pleasure. The first obvious question is what is HPV and how do people get it? Well, HPV, as you said, is the human papilloma virus, and it's actually a group of over 150 related viruses that they've identified. They're called papilloma virus because they uh, tend to cause papillomas, which are actually warts, and they, um, which are typically non-cancerous tumors. The uh, strains of the HP virus that cause warts to grow on the hands and feet are not usually the same uh, strains that cause the warts that you get in your genital areas. The genital areas, um, the warts down there can be flesh colored, they can be a little darker, they can be flat, they can be round, they can be single, they can be in clusters. They may be anywhere on the, the penis, the vagina, the cervix, uh, the anus, and they've even been found in the mouth too. More than 40 of these viruses can be easily spread through sexual contact, skin-to-skin -skin contact, through oral sex, even through genital sex, through anal sex, and sometimes even during delivery. And the virus is not casually transmitted, like with kissing or drinking from somebody else, and they don't think it enters the bloodstream either, so it's not likely to infect somewhere else in the body other than where it's come in skin-to-skin -to -skin contact with. So it's more surface, surface related with the contact, uh, more so than some of the other types of STDs that we, that we hear about. Correct. Yeah. Why is it such a problem? And if in most cases the disease goes away, why is it something that we, from a public health standpoint, are, are need to be concerned about it? Well, HPV can actually be divided into several different categories. They have high-risk HPV strains, intermediate and low-risk HPV strains. The high-risk HPV strains, uh, they've identified at least a dozen different types of those, and particularly type 16 and 18. Those cause the majority of the cancers that we have. Over 70% of cervical and vaginal cancers come from those strains, as well as over 50% of penile cancer. And they've also implicated the uh, HPV-16 strain in the oropharyngeal, which is cancer of the throat, esophagus, soft palate, tongue, tonsils, things like that. So even though um, you may not know that you have it, it's still something that may well be there, may be developing into cancer. In By fact, 2020, right. they, they expect that there's going to be more cases of oropharyngeal cancer than cervical cancer due to HPV in the United States. And the, the have, they have low-risk cancer types, uh, 6 and 11, which cause most of your genital warts. Over 90% of the genital warts are caused by those. And while those don't typically develop into cancer, they can be very uncomfortable, very embarrassing, and have a lot of emotion, cause a lot of emotional distress. Very good. Well, it's, and, and I think probably most people don't uh, realize mm -hmm. some of the numbers that you just, just shared. I mean, it actually is a... Uh, the magnitude of it, it, can, it has grown over, over time and obviously looks like it will continue to grow, which leads to the next question of what are the treatment options for a person that has uh, HPV? Well, if you've been identified with HPV, it depends on which type. If you have the, the low risk type and you have like the external genital warts, you can treat that with things such as freezing, uh, burning, 
with topical, they can do laser, uh, and you can also do prescription medications for that too. The prescription medication is um, something that, that can be, well, all the treatments can actually be very expensive if you don't have insurance. And then the people that have the internal cancer, like cervical cancer that women are diagnosed with, they treat that with procedures such as colposcopy, where they go in and freeze the abnormal cells, or they can actually surgically remove the abnormal cells. And is the recovery rate typically, uh, is it one of those things where the earlier, the sooner, the better kind of uh, uh, treatment is, is obviously best, I would assume? Absolutely. If you have, ex well, external genital warts, they do theorize that a lot of them will actually go away on their own in three to four years if left untreated. Unfortunately, sometimes they grow in number prior to that time instead of decreasing. And if you have anybody that's immunocompromised, then you, they may exponentially grow. Even if you treat those topically, a lot of times that virus is still in you and they may recur at some point in time. Now when you treat in the internal, the, on the colposcopies where they have abnormal pap smears, and if they find it that way, a lot of times that's some, something you can see unless you have the special magnification that they look for. Those that they do treat with either freezing or excision, that usually does take care of that but they still do encourage follow-up pap smears periodically to make sure. The ones that cause the cancer, the, the HPVs that are the high risk that cause the cancers, it can take 10 to 20 years for those cancer tumors to actually wow. form. So if you treat it early, if you treat it when you have the abnormal cells, when they detect that, you can prevent it from actually turning into a cancerous cell. Wow, so early intervention, obviously, as with many things in our healthcare world, is, a, is, is critical in this, in this case. Um, Protecting, prevention is obviously one of the things that we want to uh, tout as much as we can. How can people protect themselves from getting HPV? Well, as you alluded to when you're opening statements, almost everybody that's sexually active may come in contact with it at some point in time. The way to absolutely avoid that is to be abstinent until you do get into a long-term relationship. If you're not abstinent, then you do want to at least be monogamous those things absolutely decrease your risk of getting the HPV virus. If that's not the case, then the next alternative would be to use condoms. Once again, condoms are only effective for the areas that it cover. Uh, in the case, you know, I was speaking of, you can actually get cancer, uh, uh, rather you can get the warts, the genital warts, you can see those not only inside the vagina, on the cervix, um, around the anus, but they can also go into the groin folds and on top of the areas above mm. the genitals. So if that area is not covered, obviously with a condom, you can still get skin to skin contact and contract HPV that way. The other biggest way, and one of the most important ways outside of abstinence or monogamy is to get the HPV vaccine. That vaccine is proven to be highly effective in preventing both the high risk and the low risk cancers, uh, HPV viruses. And that vaccine has been out for a number of years now, and so I guess it's, it's grown in its popularity. And uh, I take it it is effective, in, at least for those strains that it's trying to protect at, at preventing HPV. Right. Even though, they've, even though they've detected more strains that can potentially cause cancer or cause the genital warts, the ones that they've identified and targeted cause the very vast majority of them. So it's highly effective in doing that. And the vaccine has been out for quite a few years. In fact, they've given over 57 million doses worldwide. Wow. And it's very safe. It's monitored by the CDC. It's monitored by the FDA. It has no, a lot of people have concerns about vaccines with thimerosal. It doesn't contain thimerosal. It's not a live virus, so it's not something that's dangerous to, to get. About the only people that should not get the vaccine um, in the ages that it's indicated for is if you're pregnant or if you currently have a temperature above 100. If, you've, if you're on some type of a medication that suppresses your immune system, it may not work effectively for you. Or if you've had an adverse reaction to the vaccine before. But outside of that, anybody 9 to 26 would potentially be eligible to receive it. Is it a one-time shot or one-time uh, medication or do you have to get multiple? No, it's actually a series of three. Okay. You get one initially, you get one two months after your initial shot, and then you get one six months after your initial shot. They give it in the muscle, usually in the arm. They can give it in the hip, but usually the arm. It's very, very rare to have a serious side effect. Most serious side effects 
could potentially be like uh, shortness of breath, uh, difficulty breathing, feeling like your heart's racing. They've even had some people report fainting, which they don't think it's from the vaccine itself. <laughs> We've even had people faint just from getting a TB skin right. test at the health department. So, But it is not uncommon to have a little bit of discomfort at the injection site. That's the most common problem with it. You can also get a localized redness or a little bit of um, swelling. That's not uncommon with that. This, this kind of leads into the, the question that uh, is often raised or you hear debated somewhat in the... Uh, in the media and, and, and in community circles about, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's encouraged for younger uh, folks because you want to have that protection when, whether or not they're sexually active at a young age or not, so that when they are, that they will be protected. You know, there's some debate that, okay, well, that's, that's maybe encouraging um, sexual activity. Um, do you have thoughts about that or how people could sort of look at the sort of the pros and cons in weighing that because I'm sure parents, that's an uncomfortable sort of position for perhaps parents or, or folks to be in and trying to think of, well, is this the best way for us to move forward with trying to prevent HPV for my child? Well, I would strongly recommend the HPV vaccine and the young age is, as you said, to help try to get it into their system so that they do build up immunity before they're sexually active. That is a conversation that every parent needs to have with their child at some point in time, uncomfortable or not. In Stanley County, our, our uh, teen pregnancy rate, we, we're sitting 50th in the state. There's 50 counties that have lower pregnancy rates, but 50 counties that have higher pregnancy, teen pregnancy rates. So obviously we have a lot of sexually active teens. If you wait until they're old enough to make that decision on their own, it may be too late. That being said, they still encourage you to get the virus even if you, uh, the vaccine even if you have been sexually active because even if you've been exposed to one of those strains, you may not have been exposed to all of them and it can still provide protection against some of those other strains. However, you got to consider those other factors too. What if, God forbid, your child is sexually abused? That's something you can't account for. You want to have them protected early if that's the case. The other thing is, you know, a lot of children will not talk to their parents and it's great if you have that conversation with them but a lot of times your children will tell you they're not being sexually active and they are but they did a study that came out in the journal of pediatrics in 2012 done by emory university and kaiser permanente and they did a study of 1400 girls that were 500 were vaccinated and 900 were not in that group of girls over a four-year period the ones that were vaccinated were no more likely to get a sexually transmitted infection we're no more likely to become pregnant. We're no more likely to discuss contraception. So they did not find any kind of statistical difference in increase in sexual activity, which if that's a parent's concern. The other thing I'd really add to that is when children are teens, they're still encouraged to get several vaccines. One of them is the meningococcal to prevent meningitis. The other is the update on their tetanus and their pertussis vaccine for tetanus and whooping cough. We have 80% rate of children getting that and there's like a 38 percent rate again the hpv hpv kills many more people from cervical cancer than you see die from meningitis or from whooping complications cough. from whooping cough so you're you're going to be able to you should approach it as a preventable disease you know preventable infection as opposed to encouraging sexual yeah. activity well and i think that's uh, you you basically hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, we all have to gauge and weigh risk, and if you're if you're uh, weighting that risk on, on, you know what the potential may be compared to other things, that's a good example where the risks really outweigh for that child. Having that protection is uh, is going to be actually more valuable down the road than something like the other. Not that we don't want them to get the pertussis and the tetanus. Uh, vaccination but that's uh, that's a good point and where can folks um, get uh, the HPV vaccine obviously I guess it's we have it at the health department obviously but other places I'm sure as well that's right many of the pediatricians offices will have it some of the family practice offices have it also if they see a, a large number of uh, adolescents actually I believe they have it at some of the pharmacies too I think Walgreens actually has it we do have it available at the health department. 
It is at no charge for uh, people that are 18 and under if they have no insurance or if they have Medicaid. If they do have insurance or they're over 18, they can still get the injection. It's a little pricey. It's $160 per shot at the health department. And like I said, it is a series of three shots. But we do provide uh, uh, paperwork that they can submit to their insurance company if they want to to, be, to get reimbursed if they're able to. Very good. Well, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, to this particular topic, it's real informative and uh, helping us sort of gauge um, these this new, I think, new to many people type of STD that uh, we often don't uh, hear too much about. I just think it's very, very important to to let people be aware that that vaccine is out there. It's very safe. It's extremely effective, and it's certainly certainly great at preventing cervical cancer, which is you know, certainly something you wouldn't want your child to have to go through later on as an adult. Any right. adult that's had to go through any type of procedure like that would certainly know it's much better to prevent it than to treat it. Very good. Well, Patty, I want to thank you for being with me today and, and discussing this particular topic. I realize that some of the topics and issues that uh, we bring to folks on the uh, this particular program may be a little bit uh, controversial or outside the norm of uh, conversation, things such as teen pregnancy and STDs, but it's something that uh, we need to look at ways of preventing. And so this is certainly one of those, um, this is one of those opportunities. And we hope that some of this information is something you can share with uh, you and your family as well. So until we meet again, I hope you all have a healthy day. Thank you.